So last time we discussed uh, some relations between braid varieties and maybe positroid varieties and being homologous. So I tried to outline the general picture. I didn't really give concrete examples, except for a very easy one for uh, two strand braids. So here is like one concrete non-trivial example, which I really like. And especially this top picture keeps me up at night for last, I don't know, 10 years. So there is a lot of information here. So this picture is from a paper of Danfield, Gukov, and Rasmussen, who studied uh, this uh, kavanagh frazanski and triple grade link homology. Uh, and they computed a bunch of examples. So rather they predicted based on various uh, tools and methods what this homology should look like. All in this particular case, this prediction was certainly confirmed. Uh, and there is a lot of stuff going on in this picture. So let me try to explain some pieces. So this picture represents the triply graded homology of three, four torus knot. So it's triply graded. So you have a degree, which is represented by the height by the vertical direction. So this is a degree zero, this is a degree one, and this is a degree two. And then horizontal direction is supposed to represent the Q degree, whatever it is. And then these numbers written there are the T degree or homological degree, maybe in some slightly weirder conventions that I won't really discuss. But in any case, you have three gradings and the whole homology is 11 dimensional. So there are 11 dots in this picture. There are five dots in A degree zero, there are five dots in A degree one, and there is one dot in A degree two. And so in particular, as I said many times, we're interested mostly in A degree zero. So these are these five dots here, which happens to be a Catalan number, but that may be not so important right now. What is more important is like, what is the corresponding algebraic variety? What is the braid variety that I talked about last time? And that was also studied by a separate group of people, uh, most notably Thomas Lam and his collaborators uh, in the world of cluster algebras and cluster varieties. So they considered the variety corresponding to cluster algebra of type E6. And I will explain why E6 probably next time, but I mean, it doesn't matter really. Uh, so you have E6 linking diagram. Uh, you can build a very specific cluster algebra for it. And then there is algebraic procedure how to build cluster variety if you know what it is. If you don't know what it is, it is just essentially up to some torus. It's a positroid variety. So this is this open stratum uh, in Grassmannian 3.7, which I denoted by P3.7 last time. So some miners, again, represent every uh, point in the Grassmannian 3.7 by 3 by 7 matrix. And you require that cyclically consecutive 3 by 3 miners uh, are all non-zero. And up to some torus, this is this variety. And uh, so these people also computed the homology of this variety, even before uh, understanding the relation to non homology. And so in particular, they found out that the homology is five dimensional. Uh, it's concentrated in even degrees, H0, H2, H4, and H6. So H0 is one dimensional, H2 is one dimensional, H6 is one dimensional, but H4 is interesting and two dimensional. And this perfectly matches this bottom row here because they have zero, two, four, four, six, and there's exactly the same numbers. And again, like maybe I didn't say it clearly last time, but it's not true that this variety has a fine paving or anything like this. It's pretty complicated, non-compact variety. Uh, so it's not completely clear as we speak why this homology is all given. And another feature of this homology, which uh, was phrased differently in these two worlds. So in this world, in the original paper of Danfield, Gukov, and Rasmussen, which goes back to 2005 or 2006, they observed that there is a perfect symmetry of this picture. So there is a vertical axis of symmetry. And if you flip it, of course, you get the same picture up to some regrading, which they wrote down explicitly. But it's clear that all these dots are symmetric. Uh, in this picture, it's less symmetric. But what they observed is so-called curious hard lashes property, which was also observed in many different settings, which are closely related. So there is a unique class in H2. So there is a unique algebraic two form here. Uh, and you can look at powers of this two form, and this would give this class in H4 and this class in H6. Uh, and what they observe is that this 
multiplication by this class in H2 actually gives you an action of SL2, but it's centered slightly weirdly. So these two rows in, that are written here correspond to the weight filtration in cohomology. And so this action would preserve the weight or rather the difference between the weight and homological degree. Uh, and so there is an SL2 representation here, which is four dimensional. And then there is a separate SL2 representation here, which is just one dimensional and trivial. But in general, you always have this action of SL2. And if you center things properly, you would see that the picture is symmetric. And so this table, uh, 46 is actually bigraded again by homological degree and the weight filtration. And if you do a proper change of gradings, you get this picture, which is clearly symmetric, but also there is an SL2 action here. And it's natural to assume that there is an SL2 action here. And so I think like, again, I perfectly, I personally think that like these two pictures are very nice and illustrate like the first non-trivial example that people can compute and study in all possible details in both languages in many settings. And like, their computation of homology is completely independent of not homology, just uses some recursions in cluster world and some Meyer sequences and things like this. But here we got completely different computation and matches. So I think it's really cool. And nice. And another thing is that, like, where is this SL2 action? So for them, uh, one property of cluster varieties is that there is a pretty canonical two form, which is very, very important for building this cluster structure, whatever it is. And so this two form is not random. And so I guess what I'll try to explain how to build this two form and not homology and how to relate it to various structures here and how to actually prove this symmetry, at least what is the idea. Okay. So this is kind of illustration for uh, the previous lecture, uh, but it's also, I think, uh, announcement uh, and advertisement for what will follow because that will be a bit more abstract, but I'll try to keep it easy. And again, please ask questions if you have any. Uh, so any questions about these two pictures? So I just borrowed them from the picture of Danfield Gukul Rasmussen and Lamanspar. Okay. So if there are no questions, let's uh, discuss about different structures. So I want to talk about not only this SL2, which will appear, but more general, like what kind of homological operations can we construct or what would we expect in link homology? And so just very roughly uh, what happened in previous lectures. So we start from this polynomial ring R. There's a polynomials in N variables, which we would think as kind of associated to strands of our braid. Uh, and then if you have a braid on N strands, we construct a complex of RR by modules, which is denoted by T beta. And these are equivalently modules over C of X1 through Xn, X1 prime through Xn prime, where this X is and X primes correspond to left and right action of R. And so natural question, what can we say about this complex of modules or by modules like from the viewpoint of pure uh, commutative algebra or homological algebra. And so the first observation, which is very easy, uh, is that for any semantic function f in n variables, the left action and the right action on this complex is actually the same. And this is true for a single crossing. And this is true for any braid, in fact. And this is just, again, if you have seen Zorgil by modules, this is true for any complex of Zorgil by modules just by definition. So this is just true. And more abstractly, you can say, well, consider this algebra B, which is the quotient of polynomials in N variables and N variables with primes, and quotient by the ideal generated by F of X1 through Xn minus F of X1 prime up to Xn prime for all possible semantic functions F. So of course, it's sufficient to take, I don't know, elementary semantic functions if you want. So this is clearly an algebra uh, and the action of uh, my polynomial algebra in X is in X primes on T beta on every term of T beta, if you want, factors through this algebra beta because the left and the right action of symmetric functions are the same. Uh, and for people who have seen Zorgil by modules, this B is always usually called BW naught. So this is an indecomposable Zorgil by module for the longest element of SN, but if you don't care about it, 
it doesn't matter. What is what matters is that if you have a random uh, complex where symmetric functions on the left are not equal to symmetric functions on the right, it never comes from any braid or anything resembling a braid. So this is one series restriction. The second series restriction uh, is that uh, the action of x i on the left is actually homotopic to the action of x primes on the right. Uh, with the exception that you need to twist the action on the right. So any braid corresponds to permutation in SN. Uh, and the left action of Xi is actually homotopic to the action of X W of I prime, where W is the permutation corresponding to beta. So here is one concrete example, some random braid, just drew it, I don't know what it is. So you, how do you get the permutation? You just start here, label it by one, and then trace your strand until you get here. So this permutation would send one to two, uh, two to one, and then three goes back to itself. And so what this uh, fact and this property says is that X1 is actually homotopic to X2 prime, and X2 is homotopic to X1 prime, and X3 is homotopic to X3 prime. And this is true again for any braid, and in general, it's not true for random Zorg by module, but this is pretty special for braids. And uh, somehow way to remember this as people in not homology community like to say is that uh, this action of variable slides through the crossing. So you can imagine that you put some marked point here and the action of X corresponds to this marked point. I'll draw this marked point. Let's try at least. And so you can slide this marked point over here and you get another action of X in here and they're homotopic, they're not the same. And then you slide it again and you get here. And so one way to phrase it is that the action for different marked point uh, is not the same, but it's at least homotopic. So in homology, it's all the same. And then after you close the braid, uh, this means that you identify X1 and X1 prime and X2 and X2 prime and X3 and X2 three prime. And so before x1 was homotopic to x2 prime, but now after closure, x2 prime is the same as x2. And x1 prime is the same as x1. There's a one here, but whatever. Uh, and x3 is homotopic to x3 prime, which is the same as x3. And so if we close the braid, uh, we actually have an action of some polynomial algebra, except that some variables are identified. And so I think some people asked this, uh, question in the first lecture, like, do we still have an action of R? So in some sense, yes, but you need to be careful. So a better way to phrase it is that you really have this marked point. And what you can say is that uh, the action of polynomial variables correspond to the choice of this marked points. And then if you slide this marked point around, the actions are homotopic. And if you close the braid, the action of the marked point on the top gets identified with the mark point on the bottom. And so in particular, in this example, if we ignore all this homotopy and stuff, what we can say, so the action of X1 is the same as the action of X2. The action of X2 is the same as the action of X1. And the action of X3 is separated. We don't know anything about it. And so effectively, we have an action of two variables polynomial ring in the homology in X1 and X3. And so if we phrase it like this, so you can say that if you have the closure of beta, it's some link with R components and triply graded homology of this link is naturally a module over a polynomial ring. Uh, and you have one variable, one X variable per component of this link. And of course the components of the link correspond to cycles in the permutation W corresponding to beta. So in this case, the permutation is actually just the transposition one, two. So there is one cycle connecting one and two, there is three separately. And so you have two interesting cycles and you have two interesting variables. Said differently, you have equivalence relation on axis given by the cycles and given by the strands of the braid. And so this is, uh, 
quite well known. And so you have an interest in polynomial algebra action. And again, I didn't write it here, but if you have a naught, all axes are the same. So maybe uh, let me write it here. So for naughts, R is equal to one and all X one and X two and Xn, the X the same. And so effectively you have just one variable acting. Uh, and it's actually free over this one variable polynomial ring. Uh, and you can ignore it. And that gives you finite dimensional vector space, which we discussed below. This is free. But if you have a link, even with two components, uh, usually it's never free. Uh, and you can study the module structure over this polynomial ring and you get a lot of interesting stuff and we will discuss it very soon. Okay. And again, this is just very, very general property, which happens here. And we'll see these actions in lots of different settings later tomorrow and on Friday, especially on Friday. Uh, now, you can do a little bit more of homological algebra and try to study homotopies between axes and x primes more closely. So we don't just say that they're homotopic. We need to say, like, what is, do we know about this homotopy and what kind of uh, homological operations we can build from this homotopy. So let me just try to spell out what does it mean that to have a homotopy between x1 and x1 uh, prime. And if we go to put primes here. Uh, so there is some operator, psi1. And the differential of psi1 is x1 minus x2 prime. That is the definition of chain homotopy between x1 and x2 prime. Similarly, there is an operator xi2, and the differential of xi2 is x2 minus x1 prime. And there is an operator xi3, and the differential is x3 minus x2 pr 3 prime. And now we close the braid. So what happens? So the differential of xi1, so we identify prime variables with non-prime variables with the same letter. So the differential of xi1 is x1 minus x2. The differential of xi2 is x2 minus x1. Uh, and differential of xi3 is x3 minus x3. So this is actually zero. And differential of xi1 plus xi2 is x1 minus x2 plus x2 minus x1. So it's also zero. And so we see that xi1 plus xi2 and xi3 actually give you closed operators uh, on uh, this triply graded homology. And so these are non-trivial homological operations of degree minus one, which are interesting. So in a sense, they're kind of monodromies of these marked points. So we're saying that you have a marked point here. We use xi1 to move it here. And then we identify this point with this point with the closure, which I don't want to draw. And then you slide it here. And then you go back to here. So xi1 plus xi2 is the monodromy which we use to come back. And this monodromy turns out to be closed. And this gives you interesting homological operations in uh, lean homology. And for each cycle uh, in a permutation corresponding to a braid, you would have such a monodromy. And so you have one of these monodromy per component of the link. Maybe down, so one monodromy. component. Oh, well. And well, so it could be maybe not so interesting, uh, but like one abstract thing which you can do, which is if you want to say it in hybrid weights, some kind of causal duality, but like you can just do it. And you can use these xi variables, so this monodromy is to deform the differential of the chain complex. So you start from your chain complex T beta, which you associate to a braid, uh, and you tensor it with polynomial ring and auxiliary variables y1 through yn. And then on this thing, you deform the differential by taking the old differential 
and adding uh, xi i y i, the sum of these, where xi's are monodromes from above and y's are some formal variables. And again, you can check that at least when you close the braid, this square is equal to zero. And uh, maybe I didn't say this. Yeah, I didn't say this, but this is a link invariant. So maybe a theorem uh, that we proved with Matt Hogenkamp that this deformed homology is a link invariant. So it satisfies all the Markov moves, it satisfies all the braid relations, and you can define this deformed homology. And again, you have one monodromy per component, and effectively this means that you would have one y variable per component after all these identifications. So the number of deformation parameters is again the number of uh, components in your link. And so here is one concrete example, which might be interesting to some of you. Uh, so you have this uh, hop link with two components. So you expect uh, two deformation parameters and two X variables, which are alive. So the old complex is this complex from R to R to R with differentials given by zero and X1 minus X2. And that we discussed in lecture one, how to get this complex by first considering the complex of Zorgil bimodules and then taking uh, home from R. And then the xi, there is only one xi or like two signs after a sign, uh, which goes from the middle r to the left r. And this is this map. Uh, and this is a chain map because if I apply this guy and then differential, I get zero. Or if I apply differential, then there is no xi, so I get zero as well. So this is honestly a chain map, uh, chain endomorphism, closed endomorphism of this complex. And then we can deform it uh, by this rule so that you just put y1 minus y2 times this psi, this red arrow. And again, in this deformed complex, d square is equal to zero. That's easy to see. And you can actually compute the homology. Uh, so this is R of y, which is just polynomials in x1, x2, y1, y2. We have two generators, z and w, which live in this degree and in that degree. And there is one relation that z times y1 minus y2 is equal to w uh, times x1 minus x2. Because this, the differential of this guy in the middle is precisely w x1 minus x2 minus z times y1 minus y2. Maybe I'm off with some signs, but it doesn't matter. And so this is something concrete which you can compute. And again, you see that the homology is even degrees. Uh, but you can ask like why this is interesting and that I will explain in a second. Maybe let me actually explain this and then ask for questions. And so like one application which we found uh, is the following. So you have N K N torus link. So this is a link with N components. For example, this for k is equal to one, you have t and n. So all components are actually unknots. Uh, and the linking number between different components is equal to k. And so we just computed uh, both deformed and undeformed triply graded homology for this link. And so how to describe the answer? Again, like if you like combinatorics, you can do it recursively as I sketched in the first lecture. So there is some really complicated recursive description and there are some more explicit combinatorial formulas, but it doesn't give you, for example, the module structure uh, for this axis and it doesn't give you some other interesting structures. And instead we deform the homology and say that the result is J to the K uh, where J is the following ideal. So you have the polynomial ring in two n even variables, x1 through xn and y1 through yn and n odd variables, theta1 through theta n. And you look at the ideal generated by xi minus xj, yi minus yj and theta i minus theta j. 
and you take intersection of such ideals uh, for i not equal to j. Uh, so if you don't like these odd variables, you can just ignore them. So again, if you restrict to degree zero part, uh, what we have is the ideal generated just by xi minus xj, yi minus yj, uh, intersection of all such ideals for i not equal to j. Uh, and this is just ideal in the polynomial ring in x1 through xn and y1 through yn. And so this thing has the geometric meaning. So this thing, because you can consider n points on C2, which is, of course, related to Hebrew scheme of n points on C2, but that we will see uh, a bit later, I guess, on Friday. But for now, just consider n points on C2 with coordinates x1, y1, and so on up to x, uh, n, y, n. And then you look at the place where it is, at the diagonal, where some of the two points coincide. So where do uh, i's point and j's point coincide? Well, this is a code I mentioned to hyperplane, which is given by equations x i is equal to x j and y is equal to y j. And so this is the ideal of that hyperplane. So maybe i's point. Is equal to j's point. So this is precisely the equation that xi minus xj is equal to zero and y minus yj is equal to zero. And so if I have the union of all this code I mentioned to hyperplanes, uh, they take the corresponding intersection of ideals uh, and this is it. And so this is our j. And this is kind of super analog of this, which is not so important for, for now. And then we take the powers of this ideal, uh, which also make a lot of sense from the Hebrew scheme point of view and from the work of Mark Heyman, especially, but that we will discuss properly on Friday. But for now, this is some ideal in this polynomial ring. And so the claim uh, is that this ideal as a module over polynomials and axes and y's is actually this deformed homology of uh, torus link and KN. And to me, I would say this is, I mean, this gives a lot more structure. So maybe we don't know, or like the combinatorics is hard describing the actual dimensions of graded pieces of this ideal, but this ideal is clearly interesting and important. Uh, and uh, the fact that it's related to link homology, I think it's uh, quite remarkable. And uh, if you want undeformed homology without uh, y variables, you just kill them. So you just quotient by y, uh, by maximal ideal in y's. And then a separate result of uh, Mark Heyman plus a little bit of work, if you have all the status, uh, says that j to the key is free of our y variables. So actually, you don't lose any information. And so it is kind of. Uh, a paradox that you want to describe some module over x variables. So as I tried to explain in the beginning, for any link with n components, you expect an action of polynomial ring in n variables. And you want to describe this module over this polynomial ring. But instead, you introduce n additional variables, y1 through yn, describe this deformed object using x's and y's, and then just kill y's. And this turns out to be the right answer because in this case, it's flat over y. And it's interesting that it's much easier to describe this deformed homology before describing uh, undeformed because somehow, I mean, I don't know any good commutative algebra description of this thing uh, rather than uh, j to the k mod y j to the k. And yeah, I mean, in examples, you can see this, Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think that's all what I want to say here. So any questions about this uh, theorem, about the deformation and about anything? So maybe as a remark, so this is kind of one similar thing, which is uh, not exactly right in this setting, but uh, motivating is that if you have a variety of storage action, 
and you want to describe its homology, sometimes it's easier to describe a covariant homology uh, by localization or anything, and then just uh, kill a covariant parameter. So roughly speaking, that's what happens here. But it's mm, not exactly the same thing. Uh, okay, so let me still pause for questions. Uh, any questions here? Comments? No questions. Okay, so anyway, so if you don't care about this example, uh, you might uh, see it again on Friday, but for now, this is just an example. And then the next thing is really what I want to talk about today is this symmetry and SL2 action, like how to get it from this axis and size and homotopies. And for this, I want to do some homological algebra. So I want to rephrase what we've said in parts uh, one and two and three uh, using slightly more advanced homological algebra language. So you have this algebra B. So these are polynomials in X1 through Xn and X1 prime through Xn prime with the relations that uh, semantic functions and axes are the same as semantic functions in X primes. Uh, and you can resolve R. So R is naturally by a module over this B. Uh, and you can resolve R over B by free modules. And so you can denote this resolution by curly A. And so concretely, this curly A is what? So you have B, you have the variables Xi1 through Xi n, which we saw before. Uh, so the differential of Xi i is Xi minus Xi prime. And these are the homotopies that I talked about. And you have additional variables U1 through Un. And the differential of Uk is more complicated. So the differential of Uk uh, is H Xi i times the complete symmetric function HK minus one uh, of Xi and Xi prime. Maybe kind of good way to write it is HK minus one of Xi, Xi prime uh, is actually Xi to the K minus Xi prime to the K over Xi minus Xi prime. That's kind of easier to digest. And then you have this thing, you multiply by Xi and you sum over all I. And a very good exercise to understand what's going on is to show that d square is equal to zero. For example, if I take d of uk, I get this thing and I apply the differential again, uh, this will be zero. Uh, and this is not completely obvious, but this is not hard to see. And slightly harder exercise is that this is indeed a resolution. So there are no more relations. And so you can think that like in R, you identify left action and right action, obviously. So you need this size. But then you want to describe sizages between sides, and these are given by these things. And then there are no more interesting sizages after that. Anyway, so this is some uh, complex. And this is, you can think of it as a DG algebra, if you want. And so the theorem that we proved uh, in a recent paper with Matt Hogan Kamp and Anton Mellet is that this DG algebra over here acts uh, on any uh, Rukia complex T beta for any braid beta. So you have an action of all this size, which we saw before, and uh, the action of this use, which is more interesting on any complex for, of bimodules for any braid. And so let me try to sketch uh, the argument for this. Uh, so the argument is the following. So first of all, uh, you need to construct this action of size and use for every crossing. And size you construct explicitly. That's not so hard. Uh, I, maybe I don't want to write it, but it's really, really easy. And like this is why the left action and the right action are correct. Uh, and the action of u is just zero because u have homological degree two, there is no room for it. And you still need to check that this relation is satisfied. So for example, if u is equal to zero, then this right hand side is zero. Uh, but this is easy and this can be checked. So I don't want to uh, explain this, but that's true. And then you want to ex extend it to the product of uh, crossings to arbitrary braid. 
And here is an interesting idea. So you, if you want to extend the algebra action to tensor product, what do you usually do? You build a core product on the algebra. And so you construct the core product delta uh, on this algebra A. More precisely, this core product would go from A to A tensor A over R. And A has some X's and X primes. The second copy of A has X primes and X double primes. And the core product is given by these explicit formulas. So maybe it's not mm, so important. I will comment on geometric meaning of this core product in a minute, but uh, the core product of X size is just X size tensor one, so X size on the left. Core product of X size primes is one tensor X size uh, prime, which is X size double prime. So this is kind of, if I have X prime, it will be the rightmost. And then co-product of Xi i is Xi i tensor one plus one tensor Xi i. That's not surprising. What's more surprising is that co-product of UK of these new guys is UK tensor one plus one tensor K plus an extra correction term. And this correction term involves complete symmetric function in Xi, Xi prime and Xi double prime times Xi, Xi, Xi. So there is some formula. Maybe it's not so important. I just want to say that if you don't put this correction term, it doesn't work. And this correction term actually is super important for what will follow. And so one of the exercises I think is to check that this is uh, indeed a chain map from here to here. And I mean, you can explain it more abstractly why such a map should exist, but maybe it doesn't matter. And so if n, m and n are two modules over this algebra, you have an action of m, a on the left on m, you have an action of a on the right on n, and you just have an action of a tensor a uh, on this thing. And then using coproduct, you can translate it to an action of a on the tensor product. And so because we constructed the action on single crossings, uh, and we can extend it using coproduct to arbitrary products of uh, crossings to arbitrary braids. Uh, and maybe let me say that, like, because of this correction term over here, uh, it's really non trivial. So, although u's are equal to zero on single crossings, when we start multiplying things, uh, these correction terms will accumulate and they become non trivial. So, even if you have two uh, crossings where u is equal to zero, once you multiply them, these correction terms will give something non-trivial and the action of u will become non-trivial pretty soon and interesting. So there is some question. Some question so. in chat, Eugene. I'm sorry. Uh, is the a, question is, yeah. With the product the bi-algebra, Hopf algebra. Uh, it is a bi-algebra, so co-product is an algebra homomorphism if uh, you want. So if we define it on generators and then we extend it to products. Uh, the only subtlety which I'm really swiping under the rock is that this is not associative. So maybe I should say this properly, although again, I guess nobody, care would, nobody here would care that delta is co-associative up to homotopia. And so it's not actually, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. That's a good time to ask questions. I don't know why it crashes every time. Uh, I give a talk here. Usually it doesn't crash. I'm sorry. So I was saying that this is co-associative up to homotopy. So if you want to be really careful, you need to keep track of these homotopies and higher homotopies. And they give you some kind of uh, infinity structure, but uh, you can actually avoid it in this case by some tricks. So we can write something about this higher stuff, but it's really, really nice to. Uh, and instead, we just prove abstractly that this higher uh, homotopies and uh, which give this homotopy associativity and some kind of higher associativity relations. They exist on abstract grounds, and then uh, it doesn't matter how we choose them. 
the result will be the same. But in principle, there is something interesting. And again, it's like something really, really basic. It's all about uh, this algebra B uh, and resolution of R over B. There is nothing else. And again, maybe it's actually a good time to say that like because it's a resolution of R, you know that R tensor R over R is R. And so it, this is a resolution of R. This is in some sense resolution of R tensor R over R, which is again R. And so you know that there should be a chain map which relates these resolutions and we just write it explicitly and extend. Yeah, so this is an algebra homomorphism. And then cos associativity up to homotopy, I mean, it's immediately follows from what I just said, uh, but there is a trick like how to prove it uh, very clearly and that's what we use. Anyway, that is definitely too technical, but in particular, why this cost associativity is important because if you have a triple product uh, of three things, so if you have, I don't know, M tensor N tensor K, a priori, there are two ways to define uh, a action on this thing. And they are different, and they're honestly different, but homotopic. OK. So let me try to sum up things. So there is an action of this algebra uh, on any read. And there is an action of interesting operators, size, and use on any Rukia complex for any braid, but there is no closed. And so instead, so solution to this issue is you just deform homology as I did before. So in deform homology, you deform the differential, and then you can also deform use by saying that instead of use, we consider use plus again some correction terms involving partial derivatives in Ys. So this is again some formal homological algebra thing, but this gives you an operators in this deformed homology. And so what we proved is the following thing. So this uh, de deformed use, so these FKs, they're actually closed under D. So this is easy to see because somehow the differential of U is not equal to zero. So these two terms don't commute. And these two terms don't commute because y's don't commute with partial derivatives. But somehow this is designed so that they cancel out each other and this commutator is zero. Then it's more or less clear that they commute between themselves. Fk and x sub i uh, also commute, that's clear. And then Fk and y sub i, they don't commute, but you know how they commute with each other. So the commutator before closure is something like h k minus one of xi xi prime. The commutator after closure is just k xi k minus one. And so these f's uh, are what we call tautological classes and they act in the foreign homology of every link. And, and that is kind of the main result is that this f2 corresponding to u2 is uh, an interesting operator and that satisfies this kind of hard left so curious hard left condition and that operator actually leads to an action of sl2 on the foreign homology for any link l and so as a corollary this deformed homology has an sl2 action and so it is symmetric uh, as This explains the symmetry that we saw in the bottom. And this resolves this conjecture of Gukov, Dunf, and Donald Rasmussen that for nodes, you always get a symmetry because for nodes, this deformed homology is essentially the same as undeformed. And so we get it like the bottom line if you don't care about the symmetry, uh, is that we have a lot of interesting commuting operators uh, acting in link homology. And they are very new. You can ask tons of questions about them. and uh, how do they act? What are the, the other relations? Uh, can you, how do you interact with this SL2? Like what is the structure of homology in known cases as a module over this operator? So they're all very interesting questions. And this is very, very
Uh, and so geometrically, you can ask, well, OK, so we don't care about all this homological algebra. We like algebraic varieties. Uh, what happens there? What happens for these braid varieties or uh, positroid varieties or whatever? And so we need to find some interesting operators acting in uh, cohomology of these varieties. And of course, the natural guess would be that there is there are some kind of tautological classes in cohomology, and we just multiply by these tautological classes. And of course, this is the case, and that is actually one of the motivations uh, for us to build this DG algebra story. And this goes back uh, to the work of many people, Atiyah, Bot, Schulman in particular, and more recently, I guess, Lisa Jeffrey and others. So how to build tautological classes on character varieties and more recently on braid varieties. And so this FK would correspond to some algebraic K form on this braid variety. So how can it be built? So we start from the Lie group GLN. And uh, Bot and others give you a family of differential forms on the group and on some related spaces. So given any symmetric function of degree r in n variables, Uh, one can uh, construct a characteristic class, which I would call phi zero of Q in two R's homology of the classifying space BG. So this is probably familiar to many people. If you have a degree R symmetric function, you get a characteristic class. What is also familiar to many people is that you have another interesting class, which is, I mean, really it's a form in this case. So maybe I should write a form instead of H. So this is an algebraic differential form on the group itself. Uh, so, and the form will be two R minus one form. And this is closed. So it represents a class in H to R minus one. That's why I wrote it. And in fact, if you think about the rest spectral sequence for uh, the universal, for the e vibration EG over BG, this form, this class would kill that class uh, by a differential if you have seen this. But in any case, for any semantic function, you can build an interesting cohomologic class of degree 2R minus one on the group itself. And this is also quite known. And what is less known is that you can continue this procedure. So you have a 2R minus two form on G cross G. So this is just the product of G with itself. And this two form, 2R minus two form, sorry, it won't be closed but it would satisfy some kind of uh, co-cycle condition that the differential of phi two, the differential of this guy will be two R minus one form. And it is related to two R. Okay. Yeah, so what I was saying, I was saying that uh, you have uh, uh, G cross G and there is some differential form in this. It's not close, but you know the differential. Here is a concrete example of this. And now uh, what you can do, so if you have two algebraic varieties, X and Y, with the map to the group, or alternatively, you can think either you have algebraic varieties with the map to the group, or you have just matrices kind of dependent on parameters which live in this algebraic varieties, X and Y, then you can build an interesting uh, two, an interesting form or two R minus two form on this. So suppose that, you pull back this form phi one of Q from the group to X and you pull this to, to Y and they turn out to be the boundaries of some omega X and omega Y. So you have some form here and you have some form here. And the important point is that you can glue them together by taking the form on X, the form on Y and this correction term, which is phi two of Q, which appeared over here. And maybe that was too fast, but it doesn't matter. There is a procedure how to build uh, interesting forms and product of varieties. If I have an interesting form here, if I have an interesting form here, uh, I take the sum of these forms and just add this form correction term, which leaves on G cross G. And I claim that this is very similar to the co-product on my DG algebra. 
that you have this kind of element or the action of u on the left, the action of u on the right, and then you have this correction term which glues them together. And so classically, people have used this construction and this specific form phi two of q to build a two form and symplectic two form on character varieties. Uh, but Anton Manet, for example, proved this, that one can, can use it to construct the algebraic two form on this braid variety. And this two form and braid variety is constructed exactly like this. What is a braid variety? You have a bunch of matrices. For each of them, you put the two form to be zero, and then you glue them by this procedure inductively. Uh, and this gives a non trivial two form, and this turns out to be almost symplectic. Up up to some torus action, up to some other things. Uh, and this two form is closed and it gives you a cohomology class and it does satisfy curious hard Lefschetz theorem for this braid variety X of beta. And so uh, you can use this to build an action of SL2 uh, on the braid variety and you can use this to prove this curious hard Lefschetz by this machinery. So. Actually, uh, these people also observed the curious card Lefschetz in this case, but they used very, very different machinery. But this is exactly the same two four, which appears here and which represents the class in H upper two. And so uh, maybe just to conclude, I wanna say that uh, in principle, this works for any semantic function. And so the fact that I had this, uh, F2, F, so this gives me an analog of F2, but I can build F3, F4, F5, and so on. You have lots of interesting things. And this gives you, in this case, it gives you lots of interesting forms and cohomology classes on X of beta by the same procedure. You have something on matrices and then you keep gluing them. So it might be less explicit, but you might not need it uh, to be more explicit. And so for example, the next ophthalmological class would correspond to sum of x i cubed, uh, I guess, and this would live here. Uh, so this would be, give you four forms. So if r is equal to uh, three, where is r? So if r is equal to three, it would give you six form on BG. It would give you five form on the group, which is there if the group is uh, at least GL3. And it gives you a class in each upper five of the group. Maybe I'll write it down actually. So if R is equal to three, you have H6 of BG and you have H5 of G. And you know that there is a generator of degree five in the group. And this gives you a class. It's not closed, but the class in a four form on G cross G. Uh, and then by some reasoning, you can check that this four form has uh, an interesting weight. And uh, this actually gives you a generator here. So this is kind of the form which you can build from the cubic semantic function. Uh, and it's there. And in this case, uh, you see that uh, cohomology as a ring is actually generated by this class in H upper two and this class in H upper four. And it's a very natural question, which is as far as I know, wide open. Is it true that uh, cohomology is generated by the stephtological classes for torus knots? So maybe uh, I will ask this question. Some problem slash conjecture. Uh, is it true? That for co prime. Uh, whatever braid variety uh, is generated by tautological classes, or maybe equivalently, is H H H of T M N is generated.
And you see that all these tautological classes, they are in even degree. And we just proved that cohomology is in even degrees. So maybe it's not so uh, surprising. And uh, one reason to believe is that in slightly different setting, there is a space which, with very, very similar homology. And their homology is generated by tautological classes. Uh, and another question is whatever. So suppose that it is generated by tautological classes. So can you describe this cohomology? So again, here cohomology would be a ring because it's the cohomology of a space. Uh, and you can describe this, can you describe this ring by generators and relations? Uh, and here cohomology is not really a ring, there is no ring structure, but it's a module over F2, F3. And hopefully this module has one generator or one kind of co-generator. And again, what a, how to describe this module explicitly? Uh, what are the generators and relations? These are all wide open, and I think that's a, an excellent problem uh, for someone to work on. So uh, at least I try to convince that, like, besides these combinatorics and the fact that we know the dimension of homology, this opens up lots and lots of questions, like what are these tautological classes, how do they act, and what can we say about all this? And I think I'll stop here. So again, I'm very sorry for all these interruptions and technical issues. Thank you very much, Eugene. Any questions? C can you say a little bit about uh, which uh, symmetric function gives rise to this element that does this uh, curious hard left shift? Yeah, sum of xi squared. So if you have sum of xi squared, this would give you, uh, so again, maybe I should write it down. So if r is equal to two, then you get two form on g cross g. And this is precisely that two form. So you will get three form on g, but you will get a two, two form on g cross g. And this is this two form. And so the recipe is that you just, Take this, so for this particular Q, you take this correction term, this two form on G, which is very explicit. And whenever you see a bunch of matrices, you do it inductively. So you do it for the first matrix, the form is zero. For the second matrix, the form is zero. For the pair of matrices, you have this correction term. And then you have uh, the third matrix, and then you add correction matrix, correction term for the product of the first two matrices and the third one, and so on. So this, you build inductively, this two form, uh, and uh, this gives you a class in like whenever you close the braid, this gives you a class in H upper two, and this class in H upper two uh, will give you hard left. Okay, thanks. And maybe I want to add that like Anton actually used this theorem over here to prove curious hard left for more general character varieties because they can be somehow stratified by this. So this is like really, really powerful thing. And like most of what I explained in the beginning was motivated and kind of trying to translate it to not theory and more algebraic language, more kind of homological algebra language. Yeah, now I can see it. Sorry, I, I crashed again. I don't know. What that is. Maybe it might not work or might zoom or something. I am very sorry. Are there any more questions? We didn't have any more questions. One more chance for a last minute question. Well, if not, let's thank you, Gene, again.